before, I want to talk about water. I want to talk about the well. How many knows today that, that water is life? If you don't have water, you're going to die. If a plant don't have water, it's going to die. And, and Jesus is that well of life. And we understand a story about a woman at the well. We've heard the story told many times. But I just want to bring it into a different perspective today. Uh, this morning as we share the, the Word of God, we thank God for uh, for Pastor. Uh, uh, you know, he's doing a, a wonderful work here. And we just challenge you to come, those who are watching, uh, that you come and be a part of this. He's a wonderful man of God, and God has given him a fresh vision. And we're excited about what God is doing in his life and through Pastor Mike's life and, and, and the second half of his life. How many knows it ain't over? They say it ain't over till the fat lady sings. I had not seen the fat lady yet. So praise the Lord, it ain't over. And God has a second win for you. It's time to run the race again. We're not finished. We're not dead. God has brought us up this morning. He gave us breath in our lungs, and the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You don't have to go far to see. You don't, you, all you have to do is peer out your back door and see that the harvest is plentiful. Go to the drugstore. Go to the uh, uh, go to food line. Go to uh, Walmart. Go to McDonald's. The harvest is plentiful. You can go to church and see there's a harvest inside the church that needs harvesting. Amen. And we need to be about our Father's business. We are not doing what God has commissioned us to do. Mark 16, 15 says that he said, send them, he sent them out and he said, preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. Jesus preached kingdom. John said the kingdom was coming. Jesus was the kingdom and he said the kingdom is now nigh even into your mouth or into your lips. So the kingdom of God is within. It's time to get the king out. He lives within. God has moved in. I want you all to help me today. Say, God has moved in. Say, I'm the governor's mansion, and he's the governor, and he's governing through my life. See, I'm not concerned this morning who's in the White House. The most important thing is who's in your house. Because, see, I don't live by the, the system of the government. I'm in a different realm. When it's gloom and despair and agony on thee, as we saw he haul in the 70s, a Lulu sitting on the chair and even the dog hollering, People's moaning and groaning what's going on, but we're in a different system. We're in the government of God this morning, and God will feed us manna from heaven. He will feed us from a raven if he has to, and when the brook dries up, he'll tell us to go to Zarephath, and a widow woman that don't have enough to feed herself, she'll feed us. Can somebody help me just a little bit? God has a way of doing things, and we just need to trust God with all things. All things work together for him. So let's, let's read this in John chapter 4 in verse 1. Tonight we're going to have a blast, so I challenge you to come tonight and bring some folks tonight because I'm telling you, God has got a strong word for us tonight that's going to change our lives. How many knows the word of God is supposed to change? When you sit in under a ministry, you're supposed to change. You're supposed to change. You cannot come into the house of God, have a kingdom message, and leave out the same way you come in. There has to be a manifestation. There has to be. Amen. So I've got to go fast. So uh, I'm, I'm on the time schedule here. So we we, we got to go fast. So John chapter 4 in verse 1. Let's read this. And, and when the Lord, John 4, John 4 in verse 1. Now when the Lord knew, the, that ain't right. Go to verse 7. John 4, verse 7. There, there cometh a woman. Well, go to verse 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, look what it said. It started off saying he was wearied from his journey. I'm going to tell you why he was wearied. He was wearied from his journey because he, had, he won't do it in the Father's business. He was weary, weary from his journey because he was walking with his disciples and he wanted a convert. He hadn't seen people in a while. Now, he has already been leading his disciples. See, you're one kind of vert. You're either a convert or a pervert. Oh, come on, somebody. We were all one time perverts, but now God has converted us. We're converts now. And if you're a pervert today, guess what? You can be a convert. But Jesus was looking converts. I got hands raised back there. Jesus was looking converts, and here it is. He was wearied from his journey because his journey was about the Father. What's your journey about? 
Everything that we do, we should please the Father. And God has called us to do great and mighty things in our lives, and it's time for us to do them. Now, Jacob's well was there. This was the well of an Old Testament prophet that they went to the well. This was Jacob's well. You've got to understand who Jacob was. Jacob was a patriarch. He was, he was of the lineage of Abraham. He was, he was of the law. He was of the system of the law. And Jesus sat by this well because this was a special place. I mean, we went to Gettysburg yesterday. And as we went to Gettysburg, it's a significant place on the map. There's a lot of history in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was signed in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania. We find the Gettysburg Address. We find the war uh, with the North and the South. And I want, you, I, want to, I want you to tell you today that there's still a war. There's still a war, and guess what? Our country's still divided. <coughs> it hadn't changed. It's not North and, it's not north and South fighting now. <coughs> it's Democrats and Republicans. Oh, you won't help me. We have a division. We have morally, moral issues. We have an a, a Ishmael and Isaac issue. Ishmael is still mocking Isaac, and it's time to cast out the bondwoman. We got the bondwoman in the church. It's time to cast her out. It's time to quit going up to Mount Sinai and start going to Mount Zion. Come on, somebody. We're no longer after the law. We're no longer in the law because God has justified the law by grace and mercy and, and thank God for mercy. The Bible says the law shuts up faith. People are not healed in the church. People are not delivered in the church. And people are not saved in the church because we got, we got issues. We got, our hair's got to be in a bun. No makeup. You got to wear a long dress. You got to wear a necktie. It's issues. I tell you what it is. It's called law. And the Bible says the, the law, the letter kills, but the spirit does what? It gives life. It's the Spirit of God that gives life. That's why Jesus said, I go away and I bring you a comforter. Now, uh, John chapter 14, we hear it every time somebody dies. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would to to have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. There where I am, there you may be also. Jesus was not going to, are you ready for this? Jesus was not going to heaven to prepare your place. Jesus was going to Calvary. Was his face like flint towards Calvary? In my Father's house are many mansions. I want you to know what a mansion is. You don't have a mansion two miles from Venus. You are the mansion. You're the mansion today. You're the holy city today. You're the new Jerusalem today. You're the new heaven today. Come on, somebody. You're Mount Zion today. Christ has moved into your life. He is inside of you right now and He rules and reigns through you and it's time for you to pick up, load up and do what God's called you to do. God has called us to cast out devils, Mark 16, 15. God has called us to lay hands on the sick and they shall, they what? They what? Say it a little bit louder. They shall recover. He said, raise the dead. There's a lot of dead people in the church. You don't have to go to the morgue and raise the dead. There's a lot of dead folks in the church. There's a lot of pastors that's dead. And it's time to lay hands on them and raise the dead. It's time to speak truth. You will know truth, and truth will what? It's time to be set free because the Christians in the world are not set free. They're walking in gloom and despair. They don't have no, they don't, they don't have no peace about them. They're tormented on all sides, and it's time for us to be set free. You will know truth, and truth will make you free. But the thing about it is we have, we have conjured up a God in our mind, and it's a fantasy God. Oh, come on, somebody. It's a fantasy God, and God's this way, and God's that way, and God's neither way. We don't know God. Paul said, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he said, oh, that I may know him. Paul didn't even know God. He said, I want to know about him. I want to know about his pain and his suffering. I want to know about Calvary. He said, I didn't know anything about Calvary. Here is Paul, who is one of the, uh, I mean, Gamalus. He was under Gamali. Uh, is that right, Gamalus? He was under Gamalus, which one, it was one of the chief uh, Pharisees, and rulers of that time, he was, he was one of the highest priests that, that there was. He was a teacher of the law. He was very fluent in the law, and he was under him, and he said he didn't know God. What a terrible shame it is. 
Here we find Jesus who, who, who was wearied on his journey, and he was walking with disciples, and there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Now look at what he said. He sat on the well. Somebody say he sat on the well. He sat on the well. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. See, they were, they were not concerned about the Father's business yet. They were walking with Jesus for three and a half years and they didn't get it. They were knuckleheads just like we are and they didn't get the message. They were hungry. The Bible says your belly is, becomes your God. They were more concerned about their belly than what God was trying to do and tell them. If they'd have sat at the well and watched Jesus work and perform, they could have went out. But see, it won't time for them to do that. Jesus told them many times, he said, how long will I tarry with you? In other words, the Harnett County language where I grew up, knuckleheads, how long do I have to be with you? You, 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 you know, oh, you, you, you're acting foolish and, and, and you just, you're not getting it. And all of a sudden, Jesus said it this well. They went on because they wanted to do their thing. And then Jesus said unto the woman of Samaria, and there's angels in here, brother, by the way. There's angels all in here. I just seen three of them just, just like that. I see angels all the time. Then, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am I a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dwellings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that thou saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now look at this, look at this text. This man is setting this man called Jesus, the Son of God, is sitting on the well, and this woman comes up to, to get water, and she has nothing to dip with. Now that's kind of strange. Why would you go to a well and you don't have nothing to dip with? That don't make sense. She had just come out of her city. She's going to draw water, and she has nothing to draw with. That don't make sense. I'll tell you why she went to the well. You ready? She went to the well because she was used to doing it. It was her custom. It was religion. It was a religious practice that she kept doing over and over like we do in the church. Oh, that didn't go over good. We go to church over and over and it becomes routine and we get in a mode and there's no servanthood. There's no gratitude. There's no manifestation. All it is is just going to church. We walk around like this all the time. We sing praise and worship songs. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. No smile, no joy, no peace, no life because it becomes a religion. But here is God himself manifested in flesh who sits on the well. I want to tell you today, God's going to sit on your well and he's going to drop religion because God is not in religion. God is in relationship and he was trying to build a relationship with this woman and he waited all day long for this. God is going to wait all day. God's going to find you in a place where you least expect him. He's going to set on your well and he's going to dry up religion. I wish somebody help me just a little bit. God is going to take that religious spirit away from us and he is going to build a relationship and we're going to realize that we are the sons of God. We are the children of Mount Zion. We are who he is. God has created us. Let me, let me tell you what God wants to do. Right now, you are seated at the right hand of God, Ephesians chapter 1. God wants to give you everything that he is except his deity. Matter of fact, God wants to give you more. Did not Elisha walk in a double portion? Elijah walked in a, a portion, but Elisha walked in a double portion. Why? Because he followed Elijah. When you follow God, Elijah uh, uh, was an example of Jesus Christ, and Elisha is an example of the church. And when we really follow, and when we really follow Jesus and we serve Him, He's going to turn around and ask us what you want. And then we, our response is, "I want a double portion." God wants to give us double for our trouble. Oh, you won't help me. All the stuff that we went through in life, we went through to manifest and to create. Christ in us, you are the anointed of God right now. There's two men in the earth according to Matthew chapter 24. There's two men in the bed want to be taken up. Come on somebody. Those two men is Adam and Christ. God is going to take Adam out of your life and you're going to walk in the anointing of God. That's the two men. 
That's the two men. There'll be two women in the grinding field. There'll be two women in the field, and, and she'll, be, uh, she'll be sifting corn and grinding corn. Those two women, they're not lesbians. Those two men in the bed are not homosexuals. Those two men in the bed is Adam and Christ. There's two men that lives inside of you right now. Which one are you serving? Come on, somebody, because we have the endemic nature all the time. We go to church on Sunday, we live holy, and then Monday we're going to cuss somebody out. We're going to get mad somebody took our parking place and we're going to get ugly. We're going to harbor bitterness and we're going to covet our neighbor's wife and our neighbor's husband. Come on, y'all won't help me out. We're going to do all those things, but God said put all those things away. God is going to sit on your well cap and dry up your water. Because you're not drinking of the water of living waters. We're drinking of the water of our forefathers, which has been lies. We have been lied to, and I'm going to talk about this more tonight. We've been lied to. We've been brought up with fairy tales. When we were little, what did our mother read us? She wrote us a fairy tale. Old mother in the shoe had so many children, she didn't know what to do. The three little pigs, the three little bears. Come on, somebody. Cinderella. We were brought up in lies. And now when we get old enough, we tell a lie, the first thing our mama wants to do is wash our mouth out. She needs to get her mouth washed out with soap too, and our daddy too, because they lied to us. They told us there was a Santa Claus. Come on, you won't help me preach. They told us there was an Easter bunny that laid eggs. Come on, any idiot, idiot would know a bunny can't lay eggs. And it's a generational curse that we walk in, and then when we get to church, we hear these doctrines of demons, and we believe lies. We want to go out to a far city, because one day we're going to have it. One more hill, one more valley. We sing the song. One more hill, one more valley. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Come on, somebody. I'm walking on the streets of gold. One, one, one glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. Oh, come on, somebody. We don't have no bird seed mentality. You need to clip your wings. You're not a bird. You're a son of God. God wants you to inhabit the earth. God wants you to overcome. What did he tell Adam in the garden? He said, subdue, multiply, and overcome. Is that what he said? Adam hadn't done it yet. And guess what? The last Adam, which is Christ, he did it, and it's time for the sons to do it. If Elijah can do it, Elisha can do it. Come on. God paved the way. He opened up Jordan River, cross over to Jordan. What does Jordan mean? Jordan means circumcised. When we cross over, he told Joshua chapter 3, he said, cross over the river, <coughs> circumcise yourself a second time. You know that men can't grow uh, uh, the skin on their foreskin a second time. It wasn't talking about the circumcision of the flesh. It was talking about the circumcision of the heart. God wants us to circumcise our heart, cross over Jordan, and enter into the promised land. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Hello, promised land. You are the promised land. Let me tell you what the promised land is. He's the land you're the promise. Put it together, it's the promised land. It's flowing with milk and honey. You know what milk is? Word. You know what honey is? Revelation of word. I got one, thank you. So, uh, so, so what are you to do? You're to cross over and have the word with the revelation of the word because it's the revelation that's going to bring people into the saving knowledge of who he is. People will be able to do what they're called to do when they've been empowered by the word. It's the Word of God that empowers people to do what they can do, and everybody has to be empowered or affirmed. Affirmation brings a son to his rightful place. The greatest thing a man can ever do is affirm his son or his daughter. We have a whole generation that never have been affirmed, and that's why they're strung out on drugs. That's why the little girls is going off and having sex prematurely and bringing a little baby home as a baby. Oh, you won't help me preach. The church is full of it. But the church needs to start affirming to the sons. Malachi chapter 6, uh, uh, Malachi 3 says that, 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 that he is the, Eli the spirit of Elijah is coming back and he's going to return the hearts back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers. Come on, somebody. You know what that is? It's affirmation. God is wanting to bring affirmation. Now, I just want to affirm to you today that some of the, but the greatest people I know is watching this broadcast and in this room right now. Now when you believe that, you can go out and move in that gift. And this woman at the well, she said at the well, she didn't know what the gift of God was because Jesus said, if you would have known who I am. Look what it said in verse 10. 
if thou would have noticed the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, that thou wouldest have asked of him, and I would have given thee, look what he said, not water, but living water. We come to church and we get water. I mean, it's funny that my sister, she just, she just was going to bring me a glass of water. We drink natural water like I'm doing right now. But have we ever drunk living water? Jesus said, if you drink of me, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll never die. Ain't that what he told his disciples? The Bible says many of the disciples walk with him no more. He looked at Pete because Pete was kind of disoriented. And he looked at Pete and he said, Pete, are you going to? He said, no, Lord, for in you are the words of life. Watch this. What was Jesus talking about? He said, if you drink of me and eat of me, you'll never die. He was not talking about a spiritual death. He was talking about a natural death because if you read up in, that, in the preceding verse, it says, your forefathers, they eat manna from heaven and they died. That is natural. But he said, if you eat of me and drink of me, you'll never die. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm trying to tell you this morning, right now, there's a place in God, I believe, where a man will never die. I believe there's a place in God. I know the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But guess what? He was that appointment. Oh, you won't, you won't, you won't help me. Jesus met that appointment. The Bible says that the, uh, uh, the, the greatest enemy shall be destroyed, and it's the enemy of what? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death is an enemy. Don't we embrace death? Oh, y'all won't help me. When we go to church and we have a eulogy, we embrace it. We just, oh, look at her. She looks the best she's ever looked. She's dead, man. Oh, come on. Y'all won't help me preach. And we sing songs and we praise death. And the Bible says death is an enemy. <coughs> Didn't he say, oh, oh, death, where is thy sting? <coughs> Come on, somebody. Death is an enemy. Jesus was the appointment in Romans 6. He met that appointment. <coughs> it's appointed once to die, and after that, the judgment. Guess what? <coughs> Jesus was your judgment. You got what you deserved. You got him. Oh, you won't help me preach. You, you won't help me preach. You, he loved you so much, you got what you deserved. Here's the key on Calvary. This is what people don't understand. When he died, you died. There was two deaths on Calvary. It wasn't only his death, but it was your death. He took you to hell. He left you in hell. He left your demic nature in hell. He come up out of the grave. Come on, somebody. He seated at the right hand of the Father, and you are too. Oh, you won't help me preach. But see, you want to keep bringing Adam back. Adam, leave me alone. Come on, Adam, come on. dun 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 Da -da -da -da. The Adams family. See, we, we, we've had the Adams family around us so long, and guess what? His, his wife's name was Morticia. <laughs> we've been hanging around with death too long, y'all. Yeah. The church has embraced death, and Jesus said, If you drink of me, you'll have living water. Living water, you'll never die if you drink of me. He told that Samaritan woman, quit drinking the well of Jacob, quit drinking the law, and drink grace and mercy, and you'll never die. Ain't it amazing over in Mount Sinai, Moses come down, Charlton Heston with his long flowing hair, as he come down and he held the Ten Commandments, and he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Ain't it amazing when he came down off that mountain, 3,000 souls lost their life. But ain't it amazing today at Pentecost when Peter got up and preached inspired by the Holy Ghost, 3,000 souls was added to the church. Oh, you won't help me preach? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It's time for the church to preach by the Holy Ghost. It's time for the church to preach the Spirit of God, which heals, which delivers, which raises up the dead, which do, does exploit. You're supposed to do exploits. Well, I'm not a preacher. You might not be a preacher, but you sure are a priest. And we're not after the order of Levi either. I don't wear Levi's no more. I'm trying to get somebody to design some pants that says Order of Melchizedek. Oh, would somebody help me? Can you imagine some pants walking around Melchizedek? You'd be walking like a king if you had Melchizedek pants on. 
What did Melchizedek bring Abraham? He brought Abraham bread and wine. Why? Bread and wine. Why bread and wine? Why bread and wine? What did Jesus do at his last supper? Bread and wine. Why? Because it was finished work. Jesus has brought you finished work, and it's time for you to commune in the finished work. Oh, somebody help me preach. He said, as often as you eat my bread, he said, many of you die, many of you sleep, many of you are sick. What was he talking about? You know what they used to tell us in church? When we took communion, they'd say, if you are not worthy to eat this and you're a sinner, you'll die. That ain't what that scripture meant. That scripture meant you did not discern what he did for you at Calvary. Law says don't eat of him. Law says you're going to die. Law is critical. Why was the law given? It imputed the sin. The Bible says without the law there would be no sin. But why was the law given? It was magnify, it was to magnify the sin, the similitude of man's sins, so a man could come to himself and say, I need a God that can save me from my sin because I got this law. And grace come up and said, I'll be the lawyer. Because, see, the lawyers and the scribes was trying to find loopholes to get around the system just like we do in the church. Oh, you won't help me preach. But Jesus said, I'll be the lawyer. I'll lay down my life so you don't have to die. I'm going to give my life so you can live. Ain't it amazing that in the, that in the garden, Adam took Eden which was paradise, and made a graveyard. But Jesus took the graveyard and made paradise. Oh, you won't help me preach. You won't help me preach. Jesus took Eden. Jesus took a, a grave of death and made it life. The woman came in that day, and I believe it was Mary, and she said, I perceive that you are the gardener. You know what? She was right. He's the gardener of our soul, according to Song of Solomon. Oh, you won't help me preach? He's the gardener. He is cleaning out all of the weeds and all of the thorns and all of the thistles. And man don't have to work by the sweat of his brow any longer. Come on, somebody. Because it ain't no sweat. Adam is sweat is in Adam. But in Christ, there's peace. In Christ, there's joy. In Christ, there's, there's the gifts of the Spirit, gentleness and, and meekness and long-suffering and love and, and, and all the fruits of the Spirit. See, the problem is we're still in a, in a curse called sweat. You know what we still think? We still think in the church that the Sabbath day is on a Sunday. We still think, the Jews think, that on Saturday the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day ain't a day. The Sabbath day is a person. Jesus is our Sabbath. He's Lord of Sabbath. I wish somebody helped me. And if I want to cut my grass on Sunday, I can cut my grass on Sunday and I ain't even thinking about going to hell. Oh, you won't help me preach. You won't help me preach. If I want to get up and if I want to paint my house on Sunday, well, I have all rights to do it. But your church says you're going to hell. That's law and legalism. You know why? Because they don't know that the Lord of Sabbath is a person. The year of Jubilee, every 50 years, man is set free. Let me tell you something. Jesus is our Jubilee. I don't have to wait 50 years for him to come and release me of anything. I get free every day. Oh, you will help me free. I look good on purpose doing this and just had open heart surgery. Oh, you won't help me free. You won't help me free. Because there's life inside of a man that drinks of living water. Okay, 14. Now, we find here that this woman sat at the well in, in verse 11. He said, I'll give you what? Living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence then that thou hast that living water. Now, now look what it says. Jacob's well is deep. The law is deep. We could go to the Methodist and the Baptist and the Pentecostal and we could get all kind of stuff, but I don't have nothing to drink with. She was a religious woman. She kept coming to church, but Jesus set on her religiosity and was fixing to produce relationship. And he would not let her drink of what she used to drink of because he was going to present to her something totally different than she's ever drunk before. Because this woman was going to church and she had, she had six husbands and none of them hers. Oh, you don't have to preach. Did she have six? Huh? Six husbands? 
We're going to read it. Watch this. Watch this. If thou knew her, if thou knowest the gift of God, the woman said to her, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw, draw with. The well is deep. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof, and his children and his cattle? And look at what she's doing. She's identifying the anointed as the law. That's what we do in the church. We conjure up stuff. Vex and vexation. Vanity of the minds. We create the God that we want to serve. Don't we? That's why nothing happens. Did you know the same results that you're doing is going to produce the same results? If you keep doing stuff, it's going to produce the same results. Are you tired of doing the same thing over and over? Are you tired of going to church and nothing's happening? Well, maybe you're drinking of Jacob's well. He, I'm telling you, Jesus is going to sit on your well until it dries up. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing up into, there's that everlasting life word again. Why does Jesus keep talking about life? He said, well, I'll tell you why, it's easy. It's so simple. He said, I come that you may have. He didn't come to carry you to heaven. He came to give you life. Jesus came to give you life because Adam, what did Adam give you? What was Adam's curse? Death. Adam chose death. He chose the tree of good and evil, right? It was just as good as it is evil. There's a lot of people that's doing good, but they judge evil. And they, they, one of them's God. Oh, you won't help me. You won't help me here. That tree was duality. It was just as good as it was evil. If this man right here is a mass murder and this woman's a saint in the most high church, and she has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof, and this man, man is a heathen from a heathenistic background, and that's all he knows, they're both guilty. There was two trees over in, 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 in uh, Genesis, right? There was a tree of good and evil, and there was the tree of what? Life. Guess what? You get to the book of Revelations, there ain't no two trees. Because from Genesis to Revelation is bringing you out of one tree, and grafting you into one tree. I wish somebody helped me just a little bit. There's one tree over in the book of Revelations, and he said it's in the center of everything. There's no duality. John saw into the spirit realm of heaven, and he said there's no duality. The Bible says that the messenger of the Lord in Revelation chapter 3 says, come and see, come and see, come and see. And then all of a sudden, John said, I saw. Somebody say, see, saw. He's telling you to come and see, come and see, and pretty soon you're going to saw it. You can, come on, somebody. You can't see it first. You've got you to gotta see it. I mean, you've got to see it before you saw it. And God wants you to see what he saw. Come up here. Somebody, tell your neighbor, say, come up here. Art thou greater than our fathers? Jesus answered and said, you can, you're thirsty if you keep drinking this water. See, people keep going to church and they're empty. They're not getting fulfilled. You know why? Because they're going to church. They don't realize they are the church. When you can realize who you are, you'll know whose you are. You know what's wrong with the church today? People don't love themselves. If you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. I tell people all the time to go look in the mirror every morning you get up and hug yourself say, I love you this morning. You good-looking rascal, don't you never die. Come on, somebody. I prophesy over myself. I look in the mirror, and I, I don't need no prophet to come into town and put hands on me. I prophesy over myself. Come on, somebody. You might get a non-prophet to put his hands on you. Oh, you won't help me there. You better be careful. You might have a possum to roll through town. They get run over, by the way. But anyway... But whosoever drinketh of this water I shall give him shall never thirst, but he that, that uh, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in the everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come to draw. In other words, she was saying, I, I want you to give me this because I'm tired of using my humanistic strength to come to this well every day, and I don't want to never have to come back. She was still thinking natural. We think natural about God, but the Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Come on, somebody. That's what he's fixing to tell this woman. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come here. Somebody say prophecy. Now, he is prophesying over her, not out of the Old Testament. 
We got a lot of Old Testament prophets that's running around and they want to judge people. Judge not, least you be judged. We prophesy under grace and mercy now. Come on, somebody. You may have a hard word for somebody, but you don't tell the whole congregation. I don't know how many prophets I've seen just call mess out. You in sin, you in perversion, you in adultery. You need to come down here and get your heart right right now. And I'm over here and I'm wanting to stand up and say you in it too, so you ought to get right too. Oh, you won't help me preach. You won't, you won't help me preach. If we're going to, the Bible says covet the greatest gift. The greatest gift is what? Prophesy. When we prophesy, we prophesy out of grace. We prophesy out of the New Testament, not the Old. When the prophets of the Old come into town, what did they do? They would run to the, the gate of the city and they would say, Man of God, did you come with good news? Because if they didn't, they'd have somebody over there trying to sell them a Coca-Cola or something while they was going back getting sackcloth and ashes and repenting. Oh, you won't have me preach. They were going back getting the town ready because they knew the prophet was going to come in and prophesy and change. When the word of God, when the true man of God, a woman of God comes into town and, pro and prophesies the word, it will come to pass. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of these non-prophets that I hear prophesied, if they would have do it done like they did in the Old Testament, they wouldn't be prophesying because they'd be stoned to death. Oh, you won't help me preach. You won't help me preach. Back then, they didn't joke. The woman that Elisha told her that you're going to have a child this time next year, you know what she said? Man of God, don't lie to me. Why do you think she said that? I believe another man of God came in her house and told her something that didn't come to pass. I believe another non-prophet come to town before Elisha did. Oh, anyway, that's for another day. <laughs> Jesus said to her, Go call your husband. The woman said, and answer said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast said, Well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou hast is not thou husband in that thou saidest truly. How many is that? Six. What does six represent? The number of man. She was trying to move and, and, and birth out of her home, own humanistic strength, Sarah. Sarah created the Ishmael because she tried to do it her way. Elvis had a song years ago, I did it my way. He did do it his way too. Somebody's walking around right now with his blue suede shoes on. Come on, somebody. Watch this. She had six husbands. What would Jesus make? The seventh husband. Oh, you won't help me preach. Seven is completely. She did not realize she was going to get married that day at the well. She didn't realize that she was going to have a relationship that day at the well. She didn't, have, she didn't realize that she was going to have a husband that would take care of her and it would be agape and not erotic love. Because, see, she was a prostitute. She was a whore. Come on, somebody. She was a whore monger. She was living with different men, and she was she was she was given out of her out of out of her own means by eroticism and not agape. See, there's three types of love. There's agape love, there's phileo love, and there's erotic love. Erotic love is based on what you give me determines how I love you. That's where most people are. Most marriages is born out of erotic love. That's why they don't laugh. You don't look as good as you look, used to look. You've got sags and bags. And you know what I want to tell the guy? Have you looked in the mirror lately? You're getting a full face now. Come on, somebody. You, you're getting a receding hairline. The chicken ain't as good as it used to be. Well, we got Kentucky Fried Chicken down the road. The problem is we don't have covenant relations. We don't know what covenant is, and that's why we're in and out of relationships. Now, there are some times that I wanted to, well, I'm not going to tell you what I wanted to do to my wife. And there's some times she probably wanted to do the same thing. But we're still together. You know why? It's called relationship. This woman did not have a relationship with a man. She feared man. That's why she was going to the well because she was tormented day and night. When a man's tormented, he's going to do the same thing over and over and over. He's looking a way out in a bottle, in drugs, in men, in women. Come on, somebody. In churches and he can't find it, and he, he's, he needs to just sit down and settle down and drink from the well of living water. He needs to drink from the well of living water. And i got four minutes. Okay. Jesus said to her, Go call thy husband to come hither. And she said, I don't have a husband. He said, Thou hast said, Wed. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. He was the prophet, yes. She was right, but she said a prophet, but he is the prophet. Jesus Christ is the apostle, he's the evangelist, he's the pastor, and he's the teacher. Come on, somebody, he's all five. Our fathers worshipped 
in the mountains, and you say that, uh, 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 that in Jerusalem, the place where men ought us to worship, Jesus said unto her, her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in the mountain nor let yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, and you don't know. In other words, is what he said. You don't know what you worship. He said, But there's coming a day when you're going to, there's coming an hour when you're going to be, uh, become a true worshiper that worships me in spirit and truth. What was he talking about? He was talking about John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would go. I would have told you, I'd go to prepare a place. He was going to a prepared place called Calvary. And when Calvary came, there was a new heaven and a new earth released in the earth. The old things was passed away, and behold, all things are made new. Matthew chapter 24, they asked him the question. They said, when is the hour that you were coming, and when is the sign of the end of the world? And he told them, this generation. What generation? Uh, Matthew chapter 24, this generation. What generation was about that one, not this one? <coughs> that means that judgment is not in your future. Ain't you glad ain't no spaceships going to come down and blow you up? Oh, you won't, you won't help me preach. You won't help me preach. You won't help me preach. You, you won't help me preach. But that's what they're preaching on TV. That's what they're preaching in the church. They're preaching law and legalism. It's already done. It's done deal. Somebody say it's finished. <coughs> Did you know that Jesus ain't going to do no more than he's already done? Well, God's going to do this and God's going to do that. No, he's not. He's done done it. It's time for you to do it. He's give you the tools. He's give you the anointing. Somebody always comes up and tells me, I want your mantle. You don't want my mantle. You, you don't want A.A. A. Allen's mantle. You don't want Jack Coe's mantle. You want Elijah's mantle. You want G Elijah was Jesus. Jesus was the spirit of Elijah, and you want his mantle. So don't ever ask for a man's mantle, because if you ask for a man's mantle, you're going to get his problems with it. Oh, you won't have it preach. You won't have it preach. Those problems that come with that mantle, you'll have. I got enough problems. Da, 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 da. I got enough problems of my own. I don't need no more problems. Praise the Lord. Well, I didn't get the chance to finish it, but thank God for God. Come back tonight, and we'll go somewhere else. But I'm going to turn it over to you, Pastor. Huh? Okay, I'll pray for folks. Praise the Lord. Amen.